Today is Tuesday, the 30th of August, 2022. This is the fourth session in the second series, and we have called this session Intellectual Disability and Transitions in Healthcare, the GP and Paediatrician Interface. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and the custodians of the lands and waterways from which we're zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience and ongoing place that First Peoples hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders, both past, present, and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations peoples and organisations, and we will work together on closing the gap. So my name's Robert Ward and I'm a GP in Geelong, and I've got a 25-year-old son with an intellectual disability. And as a GP, I see on a daily basis patients living with an intellectual disability with various degrees of skills and abilities and supports living in the community. Intellectual disability affects 450,000 Australians and is recognised that they have poorer health outcomes than the general population. So these echo sessions are designed to generate conversations and ideas that we can employ in our practices to achieve better health results in our population, assisting them access better health care. They are organised by the Westwick PHN Spider Project team, which was set up in response to the federal government's national roadmap for improving the health of people with an intellectual disability and was launched in July last year. These meetings are held fortnightly and this is our eighth session to date. And so far we've discussed the diagnostic pathways of intellectual disability, early development, communication, consent and decision making, and the important concepts of reasonable adjustments and annual health assessments. And each fortnight we've been joined by experts in their field. And today we'll have the opportunity to explore the important topic of transitions from the childhood to adolescence to adulthood and what it means for the person, their family, and the role of the paediatrician and the GP interface. So I'd like to introduce everyone today. I just get my screen up there. Um, so I'd like to introduce um, Evelyn Colnane. Um, Evelyn, do you want to give us a wave? Evelyn's going to be um, presenting today. She's the Transition um, Support Services um, Manager at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, also helping us today will be Catherine Mafara, who's a paediatrician from the Royal Children's, who's going to be on our panel and also present a case. And assisting to discuss everything will be Bernie Jenner, who's known to everyone in Geelong as a paediatrician um, and great supporter of, of um, the local sort of health health setup. Um, I'd like other people to introduce themselves. If I, if I call your name, if you feel um, okay, just to, to say hello. We've got Leanne there. Hi, Leanne. I still didn't unmute. Sorry. Morning. How are you going? Hi. Where are you coming from? I'm from Gateway Support Services, so I'm a program manager. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we've got Vicky Robinson. Hi. I'm from the Tweddle Hopes program. Um, I work in Geelong and we're a parenting education service and I work with families with an ID. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, hi, Nick. Nick's been a contributor the last couple of meetings. Welcome. Hi, Robert. Uh, Nick Lennox. I work for the federal government as an advisor and uh, had past work in the area of intellectual disability health over 30 years. Thanks. Well, well, welcome again, Nick. Great to see you. Um, Tricia, Tricia Bullock. Morning, everyone. Tricia Bullock, Exec Manager at Gateway Support Services. Good morning, Leanne. Good to see you there. Good to see you, Bernie and Rob. Thank welcome, you, everyone. Welcome, Tricia, to our session. Um, so we've got Nicole sitting across from the Spider team. This is part of their project. Thanks very um, much. Zach seems to be commuting there. Zach seems to be commuting there. Uh, um, we've got um, Mick Turner or Turner no, and Michael Costa. All right. Feel free to introduce yourselves on the chat, guys. If um, let us know where you're coming from, that would that would be fantastic. All right. So, so what I'd like to do is just remind people of the um, of the session today that we will be recording um, the didactic presentation, but we won't be recording the case. Um, so, in any any discussions, we just need to be wary of um, be wary of. of um, patient confidentiality 
and things like that, which I'm sure you'd always be aware of. Um, so if you if you want to communicate, you can you know put your hand up or um, put something in the chat. The um, the Echo team are always monitoring the chat, so any questions you might have, that would be good. Um, so I might go on to the, the, the next slide. Um, so the agenda today, um, we're going to have, a, as usual for the ECHO projects, we'll have a didactic presentation um, from Evelyn about the transition uh, to adult services. Um, and a panel member will be Bernie, we'll have a discussion, and then Catherine um, will have our case for us to hopefully bring it all together um, and we can discuss it further. Uh, I'd just like to remind you about cases. So the cases are important um, in the ECHO system. So we can all get it. If anyone has a case, please feel free um, to bring it forward and we can discuss at the next session. Um, and there's also a professional development opportunity. So those who, who need some points or want to um, add that to their professional development, please contact um, the workforce development team on the email there, and they can help set you up with that. There is a survey, um, a pre-session survey. So if, if you could take a bit of time to complete that, I think hopefully the link will be in the chat if you miss the QR code on the screen. Um, we can do that. So our learning outcomes for this series um, is to recall the terminology used when describing intellectual disability and developmental disabilities, to identify solutions to support primary healthcare professionals deliver high quality healthcare, um, to assess the disparities in the health inequalities in the primary healthcare field, uh, to discuss the United Nations Convention and the rights of a person with an intellectual disability and to summarise the implement of reasonable adjustments in primary care. So for, the, for this session today, um, we've got some session learning outcomes for this session. I really to describe the challenges experienced during the transition period for people with an intellectual disability and their carers, their GPs, the specialists, the paediatricians and everyone involved really, and to identify um, the considerations for the healthcare transitions in planning for people uh, to transition from paediatric to adult health care and to describe the distinction between transitions and transfer of care and also to identify the importance of transition lead during the transition and clarify the roles of everyone's the parent the gp the specialist allied health and disability providers so i'd like to start off and maybe even get a bit of head of time today and i'd like to introduce evelyn colnane um, so to, for today's didactic presentation, we're going to hear from Evelyn, who's the manager of the transition services um, at the Royal Children's Hospital. And her topic is going to be the intellectual disability transitions in healthcare, the GP and paediatrician interface. So transitions over a lifetime are a bit inevitable and a time of risk and uncertainty. And a lot of the cases we presented at these ECHO sessions have often been issues caused by transition. Either a parent has died or the patient has moved or the regular doctor has retired. However, the transition from child to adult is a little bit inevitable. We've probably got 18 years to plan for it. Um, so why is it so hard? And also, why is it so important? So I'd like to welcome Evelyn to our ECHO meeting and hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. And um, uh, I will start by um, saying that hopefully through the course of this presentation today, um, will gain a better understanding of transition in the context of whole care. Um, and I will start by um, setting some context around what transition actually means um, for young people and adults with intellectual dis disability, and more broadly, how we can work better together um, during the GP and paediatrician interface. So, um, so in a, a pivotal paper on transition by Julian Troller and his team from New South Wales, um, they state young people with ID experience high rates of mental ill health, particularly during the period of transition. And that's, uh, this is a period that's quite crit critical um, in the trajectory of a young person's life. We know that during this time, young people with an ID and their carers have high support needs. But during this transfer from child to adult oriented care, these needs are frequently left unmet. 
We know too that there are increasing numbers of um, people present and adults presenting with intellectual disabilities and or um, ASD with challenging behaviours, mental ill health to the hospital system. When they arrive to a hospital emergency department, we often um, are met with parents and carers who are feeling burnt out, sometimes injured upon entry to an emergency department, leading to long stays within the hospitals. Um, this also requires closure of acute medical wards and beds um, in, in the acute hospital system. And at the end of the day, a discharge to community and primary health care professionals. So are we doing it well enough? Some of the other issues that occur, um, how do we assess um, the young person's medical needs? Um, do we have the right staff on board and with the capacity and consistent staff and personalisation of care to care for these young people with intellectual disability in the hospital system and community care environments? And we know that um, medications alone have limited efficacy. So what's missing in this space? Um, we do know that there's variability in care. We don't, we don't, don't particularly know if we are measuring um, what we need to measure during this time adequately. Are we assessing parental needs and stress levels during this time? And should we be measuring um, parental stress? What kind of clinical assessment tools are we using? Um, and that's something I'm hoping to explore with you through this presentation. Um, we need more home-based interventions and, and do we have enough home-based interventions? Um, do we have accommodation facilities that, that are therapeutic in nature and not just short-term fixes? And are hospital facilities the right environment for young people with an intellectual disability when they present in crises? So at the Children's um, in 2017, we established a transition model of care, which we trialled over the course of a few years, um, with the notion that transition, um, as distinct from transfer of care, is a long-term proposition. So we commenced thinking about transition from the age of 12, early adolescence, and looking at what we needed to do to assess um, family needs, to assess young persons and the adolescents' um, mental health needs, and looking at the family as a whole context. We had it, we designed a checklist um, and, and looked at um, what the needs, prospective needs might be at age 12 to 14, and subsequently at 15 to 17, what that active transition process might look like, um, and dedicated transition clinics and the development of a shared care process between GPs and pediatricians um, and other community providers. And from the age of 18, what we needed to do to discharge that young person's care into adult services safely and supportively. So the, these um, acronyms may not mean anything right now, but I'm hoping to explain um, some of these assessment tools um, so that they can be better utilised um, in the community. One of the assessment tools we used was uh, an instrument called the HONOS LD, and that um, was an instrument um, that was designed in the UK and uh, helps to quantify the severity and frequency of mental health issues. Um, and we found that it was a particularly good tool um, that helped us design support needs based on the score that was achieved by young people with an intellectual disability and autism. And it helped to inform the treatment pathways and what, what sort of support systems we needed to put in place at both at each of the transition stages that we discussed earlier. So that this is a, an example of what the HONOS LD looks like. Um, we'd shortened the HONOS um, to include 10 core items as opposed to the full 18, um, keep, keeping in mind that within a, a hospital, busy hospital environment, um, we prioritise the areas that we felt needed to be prioritised with the assessment tool in mind. So based on the score that a young person achieved, we were able then to develop some support pathways um, or recommended pathways from there. One of the other tools we used was the APSI, the Autism Parenting Stress Index. 
and it helped us measure um, the level of care that was needed for the young person um, and uh, the level of care required to manage challenging behaviours and what sort of challenging behaviours there might be um, and parent, parent and carer concerns for the young person. This is an example of what the APSI looks like and the sort of questions that we might ask a parent and carer to complete for us. When we looked at the HONUS LD and the APSI together, we actually found that there was a, a high correlation um, with the higher HONUS LD scores. We also found that there were higher APSI scores as well. So it really helped us to know or to understand that the, these two, two tools, assessment tools, were quite useful to use together. The other tool that, that was quite helpful for us was the modified level of care and supervision rating scale, the SRS. It was a 13 point scale looking at the level of care that was required, independent um, living, overnight supervision, part time, full time, indirect supervision, what kind of um, supervision was needed for that young person. Um, and based on the interviews of carers and parents, we were able to assess the needs of that young person and helped us identify once again um, the level of care and support pathways we needed to instigate. One of the key, key sort of, um, elements of the transition model of care was this shared GP and paediatrician process that we established. Um, and this was a booklet that we uh, had developed for carers and parents to bring along to appointments with GPs and paediatricians. So as you can see there, with each alternating visit with their GP and paediatrician, um, this was a, a parent health booklet and they were able to ask their GP and paediatrician to communicate via this booklet. It helped to share in, in the care of um, the young person um, so that ultimately come time for transfer of care, um, we would hope that um, community um, systems and care systems were in place. We had developed, if you just for your interest, we have developed a couple of um, and published a couple of papers um, on the model of care. The first was um, published in um, Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology, describing the model of care. And we've just uh, published a carer perspectives paper on this model of care. So um, you may be interested in visiting these, these papers after the presentation. So as part of the transition model of care, we collaborated with uh, a number of GPs, up to 80 GPs across the state of Victoria. Um, and we involved a number of paediatricians, mainly from the children's hospital, some community paediatricians, um, and a number of patients through this journey. Uh, a pivotal part of this process was the development of a health pathway uh, for GPs on intellectual disability and autism and mental health. So what, what did our preliminary findings um, uh, discover from this model of care that we developed? Well, we had a short time period to assess the benefits of this project. And in hindsight, um, it would, be, would have been helpful if we had a longer time period to evaluate the model. But um, certainly it was quite useful for us to see that 67% um, of carers found the transition clinics to be useful or somewhat useful. Um, and there was a clear improvement in carer uh, reported preparedness for transition. And that's a really key element in transition. We know that there's a, often a high level of anxiety associated with change um, between paediatric and adult healthcare. Um, and there was some, some increase, but although minimal, in the proportion of young people who had a regular GP um, uh, post intervention. Some of the other work that's occurring in this space, um, there will be of interest a strengthening care for children's project that um, MCRI conducted a few years ago, um, looked at uh, an in, in integrated model of care between GPs and paediatricians. Although this, this wasn't specifically um, related to the care of patients with intellectual disability, it certainly applies to all patients. And that um, really speaks to the, the strength of the GP paediatrician interface. So there's just some more information about that project itself. And uh, a paper was published around some of the outcomes of that model. So it was a 12 month pilot 
49 GPs and 896 families were involved in this project in northwestern Melbourne. Um, and they uh, discovered that it was slightly lower referrals to private paediatrician and ED presentations were also lowered as a result of this, this model of care. Um, GPs also reported an improved confidence in paediatric care and families also, most importantly, reported confidence in GP care. Um, the trial then expanded to 21 GP practices across Victoria and Australia and continues to this day. Um, this is another um, paediatrician um, GP led um, intervention um, that occurred with David Calco, Calco and his team looking at um, patients with ADHD and anxiety, trialed across eight uh, paediatric practices with a, a care manager led um, model, which, and, and this is of particular interest because that, that our transition model of care also um, sort of focused itself on a care manager type model um, and facilitation of specialty care referrals. So interestingly, they also use the APSI to measure parenting stress. Um, and there were clear improvements in um, the following areas, treatment and initiation behavior problems, parental stress was lower and uh, consumer satisfaction across the board. So thank you, I'll leave it to the rest of the team to continue with the uh, case study and presentation. Thanks, Robert and team. Thank, thanks, Evelyn. Um, it certainly is an important area of that transition. So I was wondering if anyone wanted to ask any questions of Evelyn from her presentation. Now, Evelyn, you mentioned in your presentation therapeutic accommodation, if we're looking at, so there'd be people in sort of regular disability accommodation. Was therapeutic accommodation different from their uh, well, it, I, I guess it all depends on what you term therapeutic. Um, and so um, often with patients with severe intellectual disability and mental health, um, having um, trained professionals, psychiatrists, mental health professionals within that setting integrated into the disability setting would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, so with a focus on a whole family type approach. Um, so, you know, certainly the hospital can't provide that environment and, and probably most disability care settings alone can't provide that environment, but an integrated setting um, that brings together both would be helpful. Yeah. I think Nick, Nick and Tricia have some comments too. Oh, thanks, Evelyn. That's fantastic. I was just going to um, ask the... Um, the transition and the engagement with the GP and the paediatrician, have you thought about digitalising that process, the booklet? We we introduced a health passport last year to our residents of our um, accommodation services, complex health needs and stuff, and we found that that's actually smoothed that transition. So it would be fantastic if you could, um, you know, upgrade that into a digital platform it would be, absolutely, Trish. And I think um, uh, ideally a parent or carer held digital platform would be um, ideal, perhaps an app or, or something to that effect, because we're, we're challenged by different um, uh, database systems, aren't we, across the state? Nick, you wanted to... Yeah, look, I mean, with regard to this, we, we trialled a, a health diary called the Ask Diary, which is not available. There's also ones, there's diaries available through um, CID nationally, Health Matters, and various governments, the New South Wales government and the Queensland government have produced an app called Julian's Key, which is very health focused as well. So there's a, there's a few, there's actually a suite of these things out there. We found the only research we found in fact is that it actually improved people's self-advocacy skills and it uh, uh, empowered people within the healthcare system. That's what we found from that, that kind of app diary uh, integrative approach the question i had for evelyn was really about um and uh michael mcdowell and other people have done some work looking at how many g how people how many people actually have a regular gps now you got an increase in four percent but i was wondering what the background rate was oh, because I, I, that's a fair, yeah. fantastic question nick <laughs> and it's interesting because when we did an audit we saw approximately 180 patients through this transition model of care project and I would probably safely say that at least 40% of patients did not have a regular GP when we saw them at age 
um, 15, 16. And that was the average age of the patients that we saw. Yeah. And most of the transition projects, when did that, what age did you start transitioning people? I think that's a quick So transferring kit. Um, yeah, yeah, transferring yeah, About 18, 19, um, we would right. eventually transfer their kit. Um, What's the, what age did you start on average? Well, they, the, officially we, the model sort of um, suggests that we start discussions and thinking and assessing um, family needs from the age of 12 to 14. Oh, good. Um, with you. the practical um, sort of workings around transition and active planning, the shared care element really has been honed in from the age of 15. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Bernie, you're... I'm, uh, thank you for that, that uh, information and all your hard work. I think that's really been very interesting. Uh, the question I have is, is have uh, in the studies that uh, you've done, uh, you've done from transition from two in two pediatric environments, one within uh, of transition from a public, uh, I think if I've got this right, a public clinic uh, environment to adult services, uh, GPs uh, included, and uh, another the the latter study was uh, to do with uh, local paediatricians and a transition to uh, services, uh, adult services, and uh, I I'd, I'd be fascinated because I've you know been in the position of the latter for. Um, many decades and uh, uh, did you find uh, a much of a difference between the two groups and uh, that and with or without uh, the tools that you've developed uh, that is um, in my own experience the transition certainly has started mid secondary age and is uh, an evolving it's not a time it, it's evolving over five, ten years. Uh, transition planning um, subtly and then overtly as time goes on. Sorry, it's uh, probably many questions <laughs> in one. Thanks, thanks, Bernie. I think um, absolutely. If we can start thinking and dis and talking about transition with families at an earlier age, it helps to alleviate the high levels of anxiety at the other end. Um, the difference between community and hospital paediatricians wasn't quite measured in our project because we, in the project that I described initially, um, that was really um, a project that evolved with our hospital-based paediatricians with only a few community peds. Um, the other project, the Strengthening Care Project, involved the hospital peds from the RCH going into GP practices. Um, so um, it, we weren't able to necessarily com compare how community peds felt or were faring with transition as opposed to hospital-based paediatricians. Was that the question, Bernie? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. the, um, I, I was certainly interested uh, in, I guess, because I believe that, that we're talking about, in, in a way, two different environments mm -hmm. for transition. Um, and... Uh, I, I don't know the level of continuity in the, uh, the hospital-based paediatricians that, that is provided to the patients and the, uh, the sort of networks that one needs yes. uh, and knowledge of local services and yep. people, individuals, with regard to transition. Uh, and, and my suspicion would be... Um, that uh, when you're working out in the community, you develop a, a strong net, a, a quite a good network, including GPs, and uh, and with the local services, and you get to know the families very well of what's uh, achievable and what's not. And then the question is, uh, are the, the tools that you've developed? Um, I, I think they would be very useful but that would just confirm what we would already know about the family, uh, yes. if you know what I mean. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think um, there's um, a lot to be said with um, the strength and the, in care that community paediatricians hold with families and the knowledge that they have, um, particularly based in the area and the local context that you have 
um, but, but for example, in Geelong. Um, so we're, in terms of the hospital paediatricians and role and community paediatricians role um, during the transition process, we, we often find that families have both. Um, so they might have a community paediatrician, but have a key contact, community paid contact at the children's as well. Um, and um, in terms of knowing the networks, that's where a key transition link that does this work all the time can be quite powerful um, to um, understand what, what services are out there and what links need to be made. And so that's very much my role within the hospital. So um, for individual patients who might have any sort of medical specialty need in the children's hospital, um, we would inevitably have contact with them at some point during their transition journey. Um, but it's so important to have those links with community um, practitioners because that's where care will end up. So it's not at the children's hospital, it will be in the community. Thanks, Evelyn. We've probably got a, just a really quick question from Trish and then we'll move on to our case study. It's, it was just really about the family stuff, Evelyn. I'm interested that you were anticipating re reducing the stress by actually starting the transition conversation mm -hmm. earlier. Are you going to formally measure that? Is that something that you'd yeah. look at? Because that would be a fantastic yeah. learning and a translation into yes. practice exercise if we could measure that. Yeah. And then and we so actually have, yeah. So oh, that's fantastic. The, the project um, outcomes um, outlined that there was a decrease in parental anxiety as a result of model of care. But we've also run another transition study for, for all patients of the children's transitioning out to adult care. And intellectual disability, notwithstanding that, that group of patients, for all patients, um, we've, we have really clear um, results indicating that uh, pa pa patients and parents who start the transition journey early um, fare better and they, they have reduced anxiety around transition and fare better in adult services when they do transfer. So we've got clear evidence around that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, thanks, Evelyn, for your presentation. Thank you today Thanks, and for, for joining us today and hopefully we have your contribution during the the case study as well that'd be fantastic um so we're going to move on to our case study i'd really like to thank evelyn for her presentation today um it's been really informative um kathy i hope we i don't know if we answered a lot of questions but it's good to <laughs> to share um to share the pain and to um, have a chat about these things and realise there's lots of really difficult cases around yeah. there and people people doing it tough and no real perfect solutions um, out there. Bernie, for your contribution as well, um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like um, you not to forget um, the health pathways. Um, so the health pathways are there um, and they probably follow a few of the subjects they do and maybe still help with some referral pathways. Um, particularly in the West Vic PHN region. I'd like to just acknowledge the, the SPIDER project um, and their hard work and what they're doing for the West Vic PHN in the space of intellectual disability. Uh, remind you about case studies um, for our next series um, and there's an evaluation slide um, if you could take that little bit of time. So this is our final echo for the second series and you'll receive an email reminder prior to the series three, which I think is scheduled for the 25th of October. And our first one, first session is gonna be um, assessment of mental health uh, for people with an intellectual disability. And our didactic presentation presenter will be Dr. Chad Bennett, clinical director of the dual disability service. Um, and we'll be joined by Jane Tracy um, and Dr. Oh, Chinda Barron, Prakish, uh, who's a psychiatrist from the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, so as it's coming up to 8.30, I'd really like to wrap it up and thank everyone once again. Um, I'd like to thank the hardworking team at the West Vic PHN ECHO team for all their help and support to do all the background and put everything together for us today. It's been fantastic. The wonderful SPIDER team and thanks for everyone else who's joined us. And I hope you have a, have a lovely Tuesday. So thank you once again. Mm -hmm.